here from Back Road Buddies and the video we want to share with you today is a presentation called Capturing Experiences, A Blogger's Approach to Photography. So when I'm home in the winter and the off season, I normally attend a Broomfield Photography Club here locally and they invited me to do a presentation at one of their meetings. So this video is a practice run through of that presentation. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. Hi, I'm Ann Huffman, and the presentation I'm going to be giving today is called Capturing Experiences, a Blogger's Approach to Photography. Now about five years ago or so, my husband and I um, stopped working full time and we hit the road and we travel about half the year every year. And when we did that, I started a travel blog, and shortly thereafter, I started a YouTube channel as well. And that was mainly for an outlet for my photography, but also to share our adventures traveling around the country and the world. And what I didn't realize when I started that or at least it wasn't obvious to me, was how much blogging was going to affect my photography. So that's basically what this talk is today. So these are the topics I'm going to cover, basically how I use the photos in the blog and YouTube channel, uh, my goals, what photos I take and when, what equipment I use, how I store and organize them all, and how I edit them, and what software I use, and then we'll wrap it up here at the end. So how I use them. So on the blog site, um, I, it's, it reads kind of like a journal, and each paragraph I put a photo right before the paragraph that relates to the paragraph that I'm talking about in the, in the blog entry. And then on the YouTube channel, I create videos that are pretty much uh, slideshows set to music and I may or may not apply a Ken Burns effect that kind of creates movement within a photo so there's kind of a start frame and an end frame and it kind of slowly transitions from the start to the end frame. And so each photo is only on the screen for about four seconds on average, sometimes more, sometimes less. And what's kind of different about photography before, usually you had more control over how the user was viewing it. You would print them out, put them on a wall, or you know, you would be showing them on your devices where you have control over how big it is, what the resolution is, what, you know, the colors and whatever. So I really don't know how my users are viewing those videos and blog posts that may be on a little phone, it may be on a computer screen. Um, those screens may or may not be calibrated for color or anything, so I don't really have control over the user experience. And we'll see how that affects how I, what I do with those. So I'm not printing them, I'm not framing them, I'm not putting them on a wall, so I lose control of the user experience of those photos. So here's a screenshot of the blog website. It's at redtaillodge.com. This happens to be a blog on Fort Worth, Texas. And so here's the paragraph of text, and then here's the picture. This is of the stockyards cattle drive. And then, you know, the next paragraph has its, its own picture that relates to the text. So what are my goals when I'm creating my photography now. So I'm not trying to create masterpieces. This is not fine art. I'm trying to use a series of photos that basically communicate our experiences on the road. So I want to make sure I capture things like mood and what the weather was like and what the environment was like. And reactions is probably one I would like to do more of. I don't do really kind of personal reactions. Sometimes I think that's a little overdone on YouTube channels sometimes. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the grand, look how fantastic it is. I kind of let the pictures tell the story and say, you can decide for yourself whether this is fantastic or not. Now, granted, 
photos and videos are not the same as being there. And it is somewhat nice to kind of see some real authentic reactions of people. However, I travel with my husband who doesn't like his picture taken, so that makes it a little hard. But I do try to kind of get what our reactions are to a place, but I do that more through um, what's around us instead of more of people pictures. Um, and again, I'm trying to do an honest portrayal of our experiences. So hopefully that helps our audience decide whether that's a place they want to go to and so they don't go, oh, this place looks fantastic and they get there and it was, you know, all they've seen is pictures and videos of, you know, the bright, beautiful, sunny days and not realizing that most of the days it's rainy there in Alaska or wherever it happens to be. So we're trying to do realistic what we actually experienced, the good and the bad and the ugly. So the whole thing. So, yeah, so here's a picture. This is Big Cypress National Preserve. It, that's just near Everglades in Florida. And it was a rainy day, so we were hanging out inside the RV. So this is what we experienced, at least this part of the day. We're sitting inside. We still kind of had a view out of the RV, but that's, this was our experience not the bright sunny day. So let me give you an example of what I mean by kind of the whole series of photographs and the whole experience. So this is a nice view of the Wheeler geological area in Colorado near Crete. And this is wonderful, but we want to communicate the whole experience of getting there. So that meant driving up this national forest road to get to the trailhead. And we camped in the RV at the trailhead before we headed down the trail with our backpacks. Here we're getting prepared to do a creek crossing along the trail and, you know, refilling our water at the creek with filters so we don't get sick. And, you know, carrying our heavy packs down the trail setting up camp. So we actually had to back, well you don't have to, you can do it in a day, but it's a really long hike. So we actually set up camp here just outside the Wheeler geological area because you're not allowed to camp inside the actual geological area. And here we are just relaxing after hiking. And then here's our tent. If you notice we've got an extra tarp over it. We found out that our tent was no longer waterproof so water was leaking in and we rigged up, luckily we had a spare tarp with us and we were able to fix that problem. And then this was a deer that kept visiting us at camp. It, we noticed it was the same deer. He looked like he had been through quite a bit of trauma there with scars and such. But So that was the whole experience, not just the beautiful view at the end. So it was about the journey. We want to capture the journey of, of our adventures. So the types of photos I take is a lot more varied than what I used to take before. So I used to just kind of take, um, my favorite things were wildlife, so animals, plants, flowers, and I like architecture, especially old architecture of little small towns or even in big cities, just the wonderful little details of the architecture. And I did some what you might call abstracts, kind of zooming in on the details and you're not really sure what you're looking at, but just more textures and patterns and just what I see. But because I wanted to capture the whole experience, the my variety changed, you know, landscapes, cityscapes, seascapes, what I call in the moment shots, and I'll show you some examples. And yes, I'm one of those annoying people in restaurants that take pictures of their food, but food is kind of part of the experience of traveling is trying different foods and local cuisines. And I do take pictures of our campsites in case anybody wants to go to that particular campground. They can kind of get an idea of what it looks like. And then city skylines. So those were types of photos that I didn't take before. So let's give you some examples. So this is in New River Gorge in West Virginia, New River Gorge National Park, one of our newest um, national parks in West Virginia. So, I mean, you cannot 
not take <laughs> a landscape picture here. It was just very gorgeous. Same thing with the Grand Canyon. You can't go to the Grand Canyon and not take a landscape photo. And then uh, this is a cityscape. This is uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio, along the riverfront there. Very, that city really surprised us. It was really nice. Had some really wonderful public spaces there. Or, you know, the seascape. This happens to be Destin, Florida. Uh, it happened to be kind of a somewhat stormy day, but it kind of gave a nice mood, if you will, to the area. And then these are kind of in-the-moment photos. Well, we needed to fix a trekking pole, so I kind of, that was part of the experience, so I took a picture of that. Um, I take a lot of pictures out the front windshield of our cars. We're going down the road. This happens to be um, Natchez Trace National Parkway. Or just, you know, relaxing. This is Fiesta Key in Florida, where we're just relaxing on the beach. And then here's the food. This was actually a little, wonderful little cafe in uh, South Carolina. We're trying the fried green tomatoes topped with, uh, let's see if I can get this right, pimento cheese, pepper, jelly, and bacon jam on top. Just really wonderful dish. Um, this is the hot brown, which is a local specialty in Louisville, Kentucky. And then this is rolled ice cream, again in Destin, Florida. I've never had rolled ice cream before, and that was kind of fun. And then this is the famous Joe T. Carcillo's restaurant in Fort Worth, Texas. So you can see it was, again, part of the experience. And then here's one of the campgrounds, probably one of the more beautiful settings of campgrounds we've stayed at. And this is uh, Lee's Ferry in uh, Glen Canyon Recreational Area in Arizona. And this is a uh, skyline. This is Austin, Texas. And then getting to the one types of photos that I love taking. This is a bighorn sheep in uh, Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. And so I take, you know, big animals, little animals. I'm trying to, re I don't really remember where this one was, but Just a little bug. I don't even know what kind of bug that is, but just wonderful. And then this is a uh, bobcat in Big Bend National Park. He looks a lot bigger than he actually is. <laughs> um, he's actually, you know, not much bigger than a large house cat. Uh, and then this is a fish in Everglades National Park. And um, this is, I'll give you a little <laughs> tip that I actually, I think, I believe I used dehazing on this shot. And I found that I used to use dehazing in Lightroom only when I had a landscape and there was like a hazy, you know, it's hazy in the background on a big landscape picture. But I found I've been using it for other cases and this is one of them when I take a shot down into the water, dehazing seems to clean up some of that as well. So just a little tip. And then, you know, it's hard for me to resist the color of flowers because they really kind of brighten up the landscape. So this is along the trail in Petrified Forest, believe it or not, Petrified Forest National Park. And then this flower is actually in a um, botanical garden, Brook Green Gardens in Huntington Beach, South Carolina. And it's really great if I can get flowers and animals together. So this was taken at Lee's Ferry Campground again in uh, Glen Canyon National Recreation Area at the campground there. There was a couple trees that had all these wonderful blossoms that the hummingbirds just love to hang out at. And then architecture. I love just little glimpse of old architecture. This is in Savannah, probably not one of the most beautiful buildings you see in Savannah because there's some really wonderful ones, but I just love the, it just found this very interesting. And then, you know, it could be these big, grand public buildings. This is the Cincinnati uh, Music Hall, I think it's called. Just beautiful old architecture there. And then this is actually a private home in 
the old Louisville in Louisville, Kentucky, and just beautiful mansion details. And so I love a lot of intricate details, but then I also like the simplistic. This is Old Town Albuquerque. So just some wonderful color and just a wonderful mood there. And then I also take some what might call abstracts. This is a tree trunk or a tree stump in Talamina State Park in Oklahoma. And this is petri petrified rock in Petrified Forest National Park. And this is along the beach in Dry Tortugas National Park in Florida. And this was just, yeah, some rocks in Big Bend National Park in the Chisos Basin area. So I prefer photos. A lot of, especially YouTubers, use almost exclusively video. I actually prefer photos. I feel like I can direct the user or the audience's attention to what I see. And because that's what I'm trying to communicate, I'm trying to give them my perspective, pointing out what I see and kind of from my point of view. Now, there are times where I do also include video because there are times where video communicates more than what a photo can. And usually that involves sound or movement. So the sound would be like birds singing in the treetops or, you know, the waves crashing on the beach and movement. Again, the waves is also movement, but sometimes there's like some interesting animal interaction that you want to capture. And so I will take video as well. So here's kind of a shot. Just I try to get a different point of view and a different angle of seeing things. This happens to be at Niblets Park in Vinton, Louisiana, just at the Texas border along the Sabine River. And this was actually in the campground. There was a little dock there along the river. So when do I take pictures? Well, basically all the time. <laughs> I take a lot of pictures. Um, and I say that because some photographers will, they'll actually, you know, center their activities around their photography. What I mean by that is, they know they want to go out at the end of this hike and get this view, you know, at the golden hour, either in the morning or the evening, and get the right lighting and just get that perfect shot. We don't plan our activities around the photography. We plan the photography around our activities, if that makes any sense. So our activities usually involve hiking, hiking or cycling or paddling. I have a stand-up um, paddleboard. I used, we used to have a two-person kayak but we I switched to the uh, paddleboard and I'm the only one that paddles on the paddleboard. Uh, my husband does not. Um, or we'll just stroll around town like some of those beautiful um, city shots we have. And then we'll do, you know, touristy things as well, like go on a trolley tour or uh, go on a boat ride. We plan our activities by what we want to go see and explore. So I just try to bring my cameras along and take shots when I see something interesting, which is a lot. <laughs> so here's a picture when I was paddling on the um, paddleboard near uh, Winslow, Arizona. I think this is called Clear Creek Canyon or something like that. And yeah, so this is a wonderful experience and I wanted to capture it and this is taken with an iPhone not with my um, good camera which kind of leads us to the equipment we use or I use. So the first season actually started out with was what I had been shooting with. I was shooting with a Canon EOS Rebel T3i which I don't know if you can see it there. Um, and this is a great camera. It a, has a crop sensor. And then I had three lenses. I used the two kit lenses that came with it, which go from like 55 to 250 milliliters. And I had 
the other kit lens, which is, uh, so I guess this is the 55 to 250, the other one was the 80, 18 to 55. And then I also carry a macro to get those close-ups of flowers and stuff. And I carried this all in a pouch around my waist and hung the lenses on there. But that whole setup weighs about five pounds. And then you have three different lenses. You're constantly changing lenses for the shot you want to take. Plus I wanted to get more zoom because I love taking the wildlife. I love zooming in to get that shot of that animal that's so far away and they don't let you get close and you shouldn't, some of them you shouldn't get close to. And so I actually switched to a Canon PowerShot SX70HS, which this is it here. So I can get a little closer. Now this is a built-in lens, so I don't have to change lenses. And uh, it has a very powerful zoom. Now it is a power zoom, so it goes through batteries quite a bit. In fact, I just had to change the battery on because I'm actually shooting with a power shot as well. This is my old power shot. Um, but the zoom it gives me is incredible. It's called a super zoom. So in lens terms, it's a heavily cropped sensor. So that's how it gets the powerful zoom. So this would be a 35 millimeter equivalent zoom range of 21 millimeters to 1,382 millimeters. So I can really get zoomed in. I, um, I use these actually as binoculars a lot as well. But I can really zoom in on that wildlife. Um, but it doesn't do well in low light because it doesn't have a whole lot of light going in. If you notice when you get to some of the zoom lenses, they're big huge lenses because they want to let in a lot of light to get a really nice photograph. Um, so there's a compromise to everything, but I love that power zoom. And then in addition, we both use our iPhones as well. So if we are in a low light situation or I want a slightly larger uh, wide angle, so my iPhone does a little bit wider than the power shot does. So I'm carrying, these are my hiking pants that I have on here. So in the zippered leg pouch, I always have my iPhone so it is ready if I want to take a shot or a video with my iPhone. It's there and handy. And Keith also uses his iPhone. I think currently I have the 15 Pro. I just bought that a couple months ago. And uh, Keith is using a 14 Pro. And I actually use some of the photos that Keith takes as well, and they make their way into the blog posts and the videos. But he doesn't take nearly as many photos as I do. And then I also use a GoPro Hero Black, and that's, I have a little kind of slide pocket on my hiking pants as well. That's where I keep the GoPro, and it's on a little shorty stick. Now, I don't shoot photos with the GoPro, although it will but I don't really see a need to. What I mainly use the GoPro for is video, and that's if I'm walking along a trail because it has good image stabilization, or I'm shooting video from a moving vehicle. That's when I grab the GoPro. And it has, I have it set through the really wide, wide lens. So in addition to the cameras themselves, there's quite a few accessories that I take with us as well. So the probably the most important one is this Peak Design capture clip. If you can see that. So it goes on, I have one on my small backpack and one on my larger backpack. And so it holds the camera. Of course, it won't work very well when you're trying to demo. And it's right here in handy. It locks in there so it's secure, but then it's got a little quick release. And my camera is ready to use. Now it's combined with also a Peak Design. It's a clutch grasp uh, handle there. 
I like that. I don't have this big long strap getting in the way. So that works out really well. In addition, when I go on, when we're going near water or on water on boats or the paddleboard, I want to make sure I'm protecting our equipment. I don't normally take the power shot on the paddleboard, although I might figure out some way to take it with me because I miss not having that super zoom with me. But I want to make sure we can retrieve the equipment. So the GoPro, I actually have these two camera floats and one of them will support the weight of the GoPro, but because I have the shorty stick on there, I actually have to have two of these camera floats. And I don't remember if two of them are enough to hold up the power shot or not. Because if the cameras get dropped in the water, I want to make sure they float and don't sink to the bottom and I can at least retrieve the memory cards, if not the cameras themselves. And then so that, I mean, a GoPro is waterproof, so if it goes in the water, that shouldn't hurt anything because it actually can go underwater. And I've actually used it when I've uh, snorkeled, only I use a floaty handle when I do that because um, it will shoot underwater. It does pretty well. And then for the iPhone, even though the iPhone is somewhat waterproof, I, again, I don't want it to sink to the bottom. So I put it in these uh, floatable pouches and attach it to my life jacket when I'm on the pedal board. So if you noticed back here on this shot, there's some distortion here and that is from the plastic pouch. Uh, I don't know if there was dirt on the pouch or it, there was just glare because of the plastic. So it's not ideal, but it's better than losing my phone to the bottom of the creek. Oops. And then what I forgot to put on my slide, so I'll have to add that. <laughs> so it's a good thing we're doing this walkthrough. Is this uh, peak design mount for the bicycle. It goes on the handlebars and the phone. You have to buy a Peak Design phone case with it, but it locks in there and it's magnet and it's not going anywhere. And there's actually two release buttons on there. And so again, quick and easy to get on and off. So when we're going on the bike, we can use our phones to navigate or we can use it to um, shoot a video as we're cycling down the trail. Keith used this last year. I had a, um, a different one that was rather awkward to use, so I'm also switching to this one, the Peak Design. So again, easy access to the phones because you never know when you're going to have a shot. So here's here it is mounted on the handlebars of a uh, key spike. So there's a little um, thumb screw there, so you can adjust the angle of the of the camera shot but we'll use that for more video than uh, pictures and why do I want to have my cameras easily accessible this is why um, this is in Katmai National Park at Brook Falls and we're walking along the trail and this grizzly bear starts coming down the trail towards us so having a camera easy access so I can snap off the shot as we're retreating back down the trail to get out of this guy's way that's important to me and then this is another grizzly shot this one is from much farther away so this is when I was glad I had the zoom he actually this was actually the closest we ever got to a grizzly and that was earlier and I didn't have the camera easily accessible. I did have it on the clip, but it was rainy and you can probably tell that by how grainy the picture is, but I had this plastic bag tied around the camera. So I'm frantically trying to get that plastic bag off and I finally get it off and I get this shot, but by this time he's like 300 yards away or something like that. He was quite a distance away, but I was able to use that power zoom and zoom in and get a shot of him as he ran away. So 
all of these pictures. I take a lot of pictures. Um, I need to store them and organize them. So I offload all the footage every night when we're traveling. I import them into Lightroom by date and then I append to that directory name. The first thing I append is basically where we're staying that night. That's how I kind of organize it. We may have visited several things during the day, but I basically put the location of where we are that night, whether it was the park we were camped in or the town um, or some other indication. And I take notes every day as well for the blog so I kind of know what else we had done that day so it makes it easy to find. And then I also separate the directories out by the different cameras because it makes it easier to find because they have their own sequence of numbers. And then I'll also separate out the what I call the non-travel footage. So like mods we did to the RV or uh, I mean, I think I was doing this past season one called Echo Life, so I would take shots of kind of our everyday living things. And those are kind of cross-cutting concerns, so at the end of the season, I'm trying to gather up all this stuff across um, the whole season and not just on a particular set of days at a location. So that's why I call them non-travel. And so separating them out makes it easier to find. And if they were buried in all the individual locations, it would make that much harder to find. And then I copy all the photos and videos to two external drives. So I try to make sure I have two copies of all the footage at all times, because you never know when a hard drive is going to fail on you. Um, I actually had one hard drive uh, get corrupted on me. And so I was glad I had a backup. And then this past summer, my laptop died in the heat. The fan stopped working and it was overheating. So you always want to make sure you have two copies. So here's kind of what those directories look like for the footage. Um, it's PowerShot by default, so that's why you don't see PowerShot on here. But you know, there's Black Mesa. And then the same day, I have Black Mesa Ann's phone, Black Mesa Keith's phone, and keep those separate. Uh, so you can see here that, you know, the numbering scheme is different. So it makes it easier to find. I can refer to pictures by number and, and find them rather quickly. And it's also nice to know what camera it came from because the photo editing gets a little different between cameras. So if I know it's from my power shot, then I kind of know what to expect and what, I, what I'm going to do to it when I edit it as opposed to the iPhones. And I find that I do much more editing on the pictures that come out of the PowerShot than I do on the phones. The phones are closer to what I'm looking for in a photo than the PowerShot. So the PowerShot takes a little more editing. So that gets us to the editing. And yes, I do take around 30,000 photos per season, which is about a year per travel season. And I edit about 90% of those, believe it or not. And about half of those end up in blog posts and YouTube videos. So that's a lot of photos. So do I spend a lot of time editing them? No. It, I usually spend on average about 30 seconds per photo. So it's not going to be really involved editing. Now I also always shoot in JPEG on the PowerShot and of course HEIC for the iPhones. Um, and I do not shoot RAW format. Both of those cameras will shoot in RAW, I believe, but I, I don't want the extra space that RAW takes up, and I don't want the extra processing time to process them afterwards, so I do not shoot in RAW. Um, and again, that gets back to, uh, I'm not looking to create these fine art or masterpieces because I don't have control of how they are being seen. So. I opt for the smaller, easier route. And I also don't, for the same reasons, I don't calibrate the screen of my laptop or the external monitor I use when I'm editing photos because it's, it's not that important <laughs> for how I use my photos. So the types of editing I do, it might be easier if I just kind of show you a, a screen. This is Adobe Lightroom. 
And I love these sliders. It makes it really fast to edit. So mainly I'm messing with exposure, highlight shadows, whites, blacks. So basically the exposure of it. And I might dehaze and I might add a little vibrance. And very, very rarely, because it takes a lot more time, I'll use the healing. Um, that's usually if there's like big bug blobs on the shot out the windshield or um, I want to uh, kind of blur out a license plate of a vehicle that's in the shot because I'm trying to protect people's privacy. And then um, in a very long while I'll use a mask if there's really something in the photograph that's annoying that I kind of want to crank down the exposure on so it's not quite as noticeable. But that's basically it. Um, if I crop, and I don't always crop in Lightroom, I'll crop to a 16 by 9, which is what this is, because that's the ratio of the videos. Um, I, but I normally wait to crop, because when I bring them in videos, I don't know ahead of time whether I'm going to apply Ken Burns effect or not. So if I'm going to apply Ken Burns, I want some room in the photograph to move around the photograph. So I normally will wait and do my cropping in Final Cut Pro. So I've kind of mentioned the things I do. So I do use um, Adobe Lightroom. And if you notice, I love this, um, whatever you call this, <laughs> this kind of strip photo strip down here because it makes it really easy to if I'm looking for something in particular oh I want to look for flower shots it's actually kind of easy to to pick out just scanning along that um, strip along the bottom I also use flags so when I'm going back through and it's like okay which which of these photos I'm going to pull in the video so I'll mark them with the flag and then I can filter on the flags and export those for the video and then this is Final Cut Pro. I, uh, as you can see, this is kind of a, a slideshow here. Here's all the pictures along the, the timeline here. I've added music. I'll use the mark marker feature to I'll listen to the music and mark out the measures so I know when to transition the photos. And if that amount of time the photos on the screen is three seconds or more I'll apply the Ken Burns effect which is what you see here it's there's a start frame and an end frame and there is a default that kind of zooms in and zooms out alternates but I find that rather monotonous so I actually go in by hand and do the specify the start and end frames myself for each photo and then I don't use a lot of transitions. I mainly use the cross dissolve and fade to color, but that's usually kind of at the beginning and end when I have an intro and outro. Uh, so I don't use a lot of transitions either. And then for music, I used to do the YouTube uh, audio library, but I've run into some copyright issues with even those um, that I download. So I've actually switched to a paid service. This is artlist.io. And so I pay like $199 a year for this service. But it really is a nice feature of being able to sort and filter on different things like mood and genre and um, length of song or whatever. So that really worked out well. I'm really happy with that. And then for our blog website, we started out using WordPress, but we switched over to Squarespace, and we're much happier with Squarespace. We don't run into issues with, you know, third-party plugins causing problems or whatever. So Squarespace handles everything. It's a real easy interface. Now, that being said, it's not as flexible as WordPress, but I don't need anything fancy. It does the job. I can get the blog posts out there. So I'm really happy with that. So kind of wrapping this up, photography is a form of communication. And so I, if you're a photographer, I kind of challenge you to ask yourself, 
what are you trying to communicate, how are you going to use your photographs, and what are your goals with it. And so use those answers to those questions to help you decide um, what photos you're going to take and when, what equipment you're going to use, how you're going to edit those photos. So kind of start with the end in mind, I guess. I think that's a quote from somebody. But anyway, <laughs> so my goal or take on it is I'm trying to make it feel like people are coming along our travel adventures with us. So I hope you enjoy the ride. Thanks for watching. If you want more details, look in the description below for a link to our related blog post, so check that out. And if you haven't already, please subscribe. We'd really appreciate it. Ta-ta for now. <music>